Kia ora koutou. I hope you enjoyed that awesome performance. We were just buzzing out at how amazing that was. What did you think? Oh, it's amazing. And it's amazing to be to be together in the same place presenting Aotearoa Town Hall for the first time ever. Yeah, and we just want to give a massive shout out to our friends at, at Vogelmorn who have brought us here to um, hang out at their bowling club. We're actually in the community space at the moment. Well, one of the community spaces here doing a live, um, a live streaming, live filming of this um, episode of Aotearoa Town Hall. So a, a big ngamahi to, to uh, Sam for making it happen and all of the friends of Vogelmorn for having us. So before we get into tonight's content, um, in terms of our kōrero, uh, I will just open us up with our karakia timatanga and then we'll have a bit of an intro spiel and then we'll get right into the questions because we have some really awesome panellists um, and kai kōrero here tonight um, to speak. So, um, yeah, minoi tato. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. Um, before we get really into tonight's show, we just, again, as we did last week, really wanted to acknowledge the events uh, over in the United States of America right now, and just want to uh, bring light to Black Lives Matter and just that movement that's going on. There was a really awesome Zoom by our Black Fano community yesterday at one o'clock, which was really awesome and enlightening. And I know I've really been enjoying listening to that perspective and 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 challenging myself on ways that I can try and total call that um, co-papa. So yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that that was going on, and yeah, I guess we can crack into it. So what are we doing? What is this, and what's going on tonight? Kia ora Tan, so kia ora, kia ora koutou katoa, nā mihi nui kia koutou, and thank you to our amazing guests for joining us for this week. Just to explain what Aotearoa Town Hall is and where it came from, uh, Tam and I are both local councillors here in the uh, in Pornaki Wellington, and during the, the lockdown we thought it would be, since we wouldn't be able to meet in person, we thought it would be good to have a virtual space where we could discuss what we're learning during this time, uh, how we can help each other and, you know, how we can rebuild better uh, afterwards. So so that's this. And we've decided that there's been so much interest and in, um, people kind of pitching ideas to us that we thought we'll just uh, we'll keep going. So now we, we can actually meet in real life, which is pretty amazing. And on the uh, on the eve of moving to level one, where all pretty much all restrictions will be lifted, it feels really exciting and almost a little bit celebratory to, to be here. Yeah. So uh, tonight... Uh, we are going to be talking about transport and urban design, something that might sound nerdy at first uh, at first thought, uh, and maybe is, but actually it's one of the most fundamental things for all of our lives, how we get around, how we move about, uh, how we enjoy the spaces that we are in. And we've got an amazing uh, panel uh, that we have tonight, and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe introduce people uh, one by one as we, as we go through. Uh, and I'm going to start... Uh, by asking Anthony. Uh, so first of all, Anthony, thank you so much for that amazing musical intro. Uh, this afternoon when you and I spoke and we did a bit of a sound check to work out, work out how this would work, I was so buzzing. I'm still actually buzzing, but uh, it made me feel like incredibly excited. And so thank you so much for being with us. Now, I want to ask you, uh, just tell us a bit about your work. Tell us a little bit about rail land. What is it? Where did it come from? You're on mute there, Anthony. I can't believe I'm saying oh, that. Oh, we to can't. A... They can't unmute themselves. I think. Oh, we've got to unmute you. Ah, there we go. How do I do that? <laughs> Sorry, mate. No, we asked to unmute. Yep, there we go. You should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Sorry about go. that. Hey. Yeah. I'm sorry, repeat, could you repeat the question? Yes, I can repeat the question, of course. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about Rail Land, your amazing uh, creation, uh, musical, artistic, and public transport advocacy creation. Yeah, well, um, Rail Land is a, is a concept tour that celebrates uh, public transport um, by taking an entire audience that would normally go to a show, um, but using that audience to have a communal experience on a piece of public transport, usually rail if we can swing it. 
Um, and in the, in the North Island, we do this um, around scheduled uh, train, trains in the Wellington and Auckland regions. Um, but the problem I hit when I had this concept straight away um, was that I come from the South Island, I come from Dunedin, where we haven't had public transport trains for decades. Um, and so quite quickly what Railland turned into is this way to use the humble power of gig attendance to bring back a service that we're told can't be brought back. Um, so the last two Decembers in Dunedin, um, the Railland audience members have paid a little bit extra on their tickets each, and we have chartered a train from Dunedin 45 minutes north to Waitati, which is a former commuter journey, um, played a show at the Waitati Town Hall, and the train takes everyone back. And it's, it's now extended beyond trains, so here in Whanganui, uh, where we haven't had late night buses for about 30 years, last year we ran a one night trial of, um, of late night buses and using, using the power of attendance of rail lands to do that. But I, I guess the, the, other, the other thing it tries to do, and particularly in the North Island, is celebrate and even glamorise there's sometimes quite extraordinary journeys we do have within our public transport network. So the germ of the idea for Railland came when I moved here to Whanganui and I learned about New Zealand's only interregional train for public transport, which is the Capital Connection. It's this miraculous ride, um, which is now my, my favourite transport journey in New Zealand, but I couldn't believe there was so little advertising for it. So an ulterior motive of Railland is to advertise unadvertised public transport services. Kia ora. thank you so much for that. I love that corridor. And um, coming from rural New Zealand, I can totally, I can totally understand what you're talking about. I had never caught a bus until I came down here uh, for uni, so that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> luckily, I lived in Kelvin, so I didn't have to uh, find too far or catch any buses but uh I lived all, I've lived all over the place now so I understand the value of a good public transport system um but I really enjoyed that music I thought that was awesome so thank you so much for that um sure. now I'm going to move on to someone who I'm a bit of a fangirl of um I've been listening to a few podcasts featuring her over the last few weeks months lockdown time uh, understanding a bit more about maybe Māori design principles and how that is applied um and so I'm really pleased to introduce Alyssa Pita Hita. And uh, my question for you, and feel free to introduce yourself in this in this uh, part of the, the town hall as well, is I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, about your work as the Māori design lead at Jazz Max. And kia ora, thank you for joining us. No. Oh, there we go. I am unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> We're all on this like super <clears throat> well muted kind of system right now. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I am of Ngati Wai, Waikato Tainui, Samoa, and Tokelau, and English descent. Um, so, yeah, bit of a bit of a mashup from all over the show. Um, Yes, I work at Jazzmax, which is a fairly large firm um, here in the Tamaki office. So we have a couple of offices around the country, one in Christchurch and one in, one in Pōneke as well. Um, yeah, Māori design lead. So <laughs> I'm not the only one, thankfully. We have a whole rōpū. Um, in around 2015, when I joined Jazzmax, there was a group of young Māori graduates who were looking at um, starting a group within JASMAC that would partly acknowledge the legacy of Ivan Mercer um, and all the work he had done up until his passing with Māori and Pacifica communities all over New Zealand. Um, but was also really about tapping into the passion that we had as young Māori graduates wanting to work in the cultural space, wanting to offer our people um, and kind of fulfill, I suppose, dreams we had as uni students and as children. So um, in 2016, we worked with uh, Dr. Hardy Williams, who I'm sure a lot of people know, and he gifted us 
nicknamed Wakamaya. And so since 2016, we've had our Ropu Wakamaya and we've grown to a team of, I think, six or seven now, um, who are all kind of young uh, architectural graduates. Um, we also have a new strategic relationship manager, whatever that means. It's basically a fancy word for the guy who's very, very good at being a kaikōrero, no, but also um, being able to kind of hold relationships and work with us in that business space. Um, and our team has, has been able to work with Jazzmax to really shape what has now become our strategy as a company um, to effectively, well, the whole company is, is seeking to become or look at what it means to be a bicultural practice which is sort of the challenge that I have, I guess, for all New Zealanders, um, which I suppose we'll talk about later, in terms of how we honour our relationship to Te Tiriti. Um, because it's not just up to Māori to uphold Te Tiriti, which we all know. Um, and so that's the work I've been doing there uh, within the practice. In terms of the mahi, like the, the actual projects, we, um, our team has been working across jobs all over the country and more recently um, I was also working on the New Zealand Pavilion which is going to the World Expo in Dubai meant to be this year in October but is now being postponed for obvious COVID related reasons but um, Aurupu have really pushed for and advocated for um, genuine and authentic engagement partnership with Māori co-designing our buildings, our built environments, our cities, our spaces, so that they better reflect um, this relationship to Te Tiriti. They better reflect our people. Um, and that's kind of fundamentally what I've been trying to champion for the sort of short nine years of my career thus far. It's, it's, it's been about how can we make our places reflect us as people of Aotearoa as people of this moana, te moana nui akiwa. Um, it's really about how can we empower um, Māori and Pacifica people, but you know, Māori especially in Aotearoa, um, to be, to feel as though they are being represented in their built environment. Um, you know, a story I was told a very long time ago, which has always stuck with me, and it was from Matua Hari Williams as well, um, you can go downtown Auckland City and you cannot really name one building that looks Māori. But he always used to say to me, there's one really amazing Chinese building near the Auckland Art Gallery. It's big, it's red, it's very, very obvious. But there's nothing that represents or is identifiably Māori. But we talk about this diversity as a city so often. Um, and that has always struck a chord with me. So that's been something that has been part of my passion. Um, and it's led to me working in a lot of quite large sort of civic um, projects, like at the moment I'm doing bits and pieces around Britomart, so the, on the city rail link um, project, which I suppose is why I'm here. <laughs> I also recently just finished working on a, um, a bridge, which is going up in the, near the Mongafo station or Mount Eden area. Um, and that was done in conjunction, obviously, with our mana whenua, and I worked quite closely with uh, Ngai Taiki Pharmaki artist, Tessa Harris, to realise the design outcomes on that as having a kind of a narrative and being explored through her artwork. So, yeah, that's kind of a, a bit of an explanation of some of the stuff that I do. So it's a combination of working within the business, um, getting out there and trying to get to universities and talking to students, it's doing this sort of stuff to talk to, you know, people of Aotearoa, as well as the project work. So it's kind of who I am and what I do. Well, and, Jordan, uh, it's amazing <laughs> to hear all that. And I'm glad that you gave a, a, a good comprehensive response because over here we were completely panicking because my computer froze. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. <laughs> Oh, you knew, you knew. You're such a pro. Um, yeah, uh, we fixed that problem, so uh, hopefully that should be all good. Yeah, so, should be good. Uh, great, fantastic. So cool to hear uh, about your work um, and keen to come visit all the 
all the work you're going to help to influence up in Tamaki Makoto. So I'm going to come to you now, Patrick, if I could. Uh, you've got some nice, um, a, a very nice uh, setup there on your screen, lovely bookcase and mm. art. Um, so you're a photographer at heart. I was looking looking you up, and I wanted to ask you why 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 are you so passionate about urban design and, and transport? Um, kia ora. thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I've got to say, I admire, I admire this virtual town hall thing you're doing. It's a great idea um, and, a, and a good range of people. Well, I'm a photographer of the built environment. So I've, um, that, that sort of requires two things. One of them is that you, you have to give it a good hard looking at. And um, it's very difficult to come to the conclusion that in New Zealand cities that, that that's a particularly pleasurable activity. Um, if, I, if I take Tamaki as an example, uh, and this, this is quite serious, they, I, there was, I read a, um, a survey about what, what people said was great about the city and people listed uh, Maunga, uh, the harbour, the, you know the golf and uh, the west coast beaches in other words three things that god did right there, there's nothing in the in the human built environment that anyone could name that they admired um and and we've all been to cities around the world that uh are often in they might even be in fairly grim uh natural environments but that the humans have built some uh fantastic things that improve the lives of the citizens there. So, it, I mean, it, there's no uh, contrast for me. The photography is, is, it grows naturally into urbanism um, completely. And if you're interested in urban form um, and curious about why it is how it is, you inevitably end up um, becoming uh, extremely nerdy about transport. Um, I, although I don't think I can compete with Anthony and his heroic absolutely heroic uh, determination to invent public transport where it no longer exists. Um, because form follows transport, or at least it, it absolutely has in the last 70 odd years. We've, we've uh, in as much as we've built or, or bad, poorly or well built our cities, it's, it's largely through investment in, in transport. And, um, and we're at a, at a really sort of um, tricky situation with that. Um, on lots of levels. Uh, it, it, we just had the most amazing experience, uh, experiment with the COVID, with the lockdown, I should say, and all of the extraordinary benefits that everybody experienced through that period. And the only problem was we also, um, you know, had a, a, a non-functioning economy. So we've got a really interesting challenge how to get some of that good stuff back again from the lockdown. Because we've kind of we've kind of boiled our urban environments, uh, you know, like the the, the uh, eponymous frog, uh, slowly boiled it with traffic, basically, um, and we have to unpack that. We we did a curious thing after the Second World War. We we handed over city making to traffic engineers. We didn't tell them that. We just told them to make the cars fit and go faster and they focused on that really professionally and diligently um, but there was a great deal of of um, unintended consequence out of that uh, it's a great deal of cost to place so we need to get balance back in the urban environment and uh, and there's so much there's so much influenced by this you know transport is the second biggest spend in, of a household after housing uh, housing unaffordability the flip side of that coin is transport poverty uh, especially now that we've inverted our cities back to their natural form where the value is closer to the centre. So we've pushed um, poorer people out further and further away from amenity and, and uh, employment and education. So there, there's an enormous amount of challenges ahead for us um, on so many levels. And, but there's enormous opportunity as well. I mean, we literally can fix the world by fixing the streets. Shall I leave it there? Kia ora, Patrick, and thank you so much for that. And thanks for being with us. It, uh, it's very inspiring to, to have you on. Now, I'm going to go to you next, uh, Sky. And uh, so 
I heard you on Kim Hill a while back. Obviously, Tam, you were on Kim Hill on Saturday. Everyone seems to get the Kim Hill gig these days. Uh, you know, maybe one day for people like you and me, Chris. I don't know. Have you been on, Chris? No, I don't <laughs> think so. <yet. laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so Sky, I wondered if you could tell us. So you you you're uh, normally in the US, but you're here in the in the in New Zealand at the moment. But I wondered if you could tell us about your Global Designing Cities initiative, and if you find any space, maybe tell us a little bit of the story of how you helped open up Times Square in New York City to to people and pedestrians. Sure. Well, firstly, huge thanks um, for having me this evening it's uh, it's a real treat to be here to be home um and to be actually kind of calling in on a call in the same time zone <laughs> um as as way of background um i'm a kiwi i'm from dunedin um and i've been living as you mentioned uh thomas in the in the states in new york city for the past 15 years so i trained in wellington actually as an architect uh which is why i was asking you about vogelmorn um, because I hadn't heard of it, but um, so I did my training there and then worked at um, Aths at Ian Atfields for a number of years where I kind of got into more into urban design and cities and then went over um, to New York City to do my master's and, and ended up working in city government there um, when Mike Bloomberg was mayor and then teaching urban design as well uh, for a bunch of international students from around the uh, from around the world. And about five years ago, I was asked to come and set up a global arm of a, of a nonprofit, a membership nonprofit called NACTO. And so we're called the Global Designing Cities Initiative. And as part of that, one of our first um, very minor tasks was to produce a global street design guide. Um, needless to say, quite soon after I started the job, I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? This is completely impossible. Um, how do you, you know, talk about streets in a global sense where it's relevant for Amsterdam and Accra at the same time? Um, so anyway, we, we, of course, got a network of experts from around the world, uh, really looked at how cities could learn from each other, what were the best practices, um, and how do we pull that together? And we really looked at essentially flipping the premise of the Global Street Design Guide is to flip the hierarchy that's very outdated on its head. And so instead of the car being king, which Patrick um, very eloquently alluded to, you know, that has been our lens through which we've designed our cities and our streets. We've turned that on its head and instead have a people first approach. And so we prioritize people walking and cycling and taking uh, mass transportation, you know, and then when we go down, um, we can give space to private vehicles. And when you, I won't get into it now, but when you get into all the numbers, you see that um, our streets are actually our largest continuous network of public space that we have in cities, which means it's our biggest, a huge asset in terms of how we can address um, all the different kind of challenges we're facing and that how we make design and policy decisions impact how efficiently and um, equitably um, we design our, our cities. So, you know, I think it's no news to anybody on this panel, the, the kind of, you know, layer upon layer of global crises that we're facing. And, you know, we really see the, the street as essentially a part of the solution to these, you know, it's sadly, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, the number one killer globally when we look around the world of our young people ages five to 29 are people dying on the streets getting hit by vehicles. Um, over 350 folks in New Zealand sadly lost their lives last year just in one year 350 Kiwis died on our streets, you know, um, but at the same time we've got to this like states where nine out of 10 people around the world are breathing air that is poisoning them. And we've got close to 40 million folk a year who are dying prematurely from chronic disease like obesity and diabetes because we're not getting enough physical activity because our cities and streets have become so unsafe. The mental health challenges around loneliness, isolation, noise pollution. Um, and of course, with a lot of the kind of extreme weather events, we're now seeing challenges around urban heat island effect and how we manage our stormwater and biodiversity. So we, we kind of see the street as you know, one, not only a, a way to keep us alive as human beings in our cities and our places we've created, but also to actually thrive, to help our cities thrive. You know, we, we have evidence-based strategies that show us that, you know, great street designs and public transportation actually also help local businesses to thrive and they bring communities together. And of course, how we which modes of transportation we choose to prioritize and where we choose, which neighborhoods we choose to invest in 
also start to address the fundamental inequities that we're seeing very, very clearly right now emerging all around the world. So we were kind of very excited to kind of produce this new blueprint. Um, and then we've had over 100 cities and organizations around the world endorse that kind of as a permission slip for their practitioners or their leaders to feel inspired or their communities to feel empowered to how they can go and demand more of that kind of critical public space in their cities. Um, and then we've worked very hard. We've been fortunate to be able to help shift from paper or theory to practice where we give direct technical assistance to city governments and work with local communities from in cities in Brazil and Colombia, India, Ethiopia, Italy, Turkey. Um, and we, we kind of work with them to update their policies and their design guidance, which is often 50, 60 years old and, and very much from a kind of a car orientated approach. Um, we do tons of trainings and workshops with with local academics and, and city officials and practitioners. Um, and then the really fun stuff um, is we help get transformation projects on the ground. We use bright colors, um, we, we work with local artists, we literally go out and show people a new possibility um, of what their street could be, help them see it in a new light. Um, and of course, then we measure the impact of that. So we can help to shift from kind of anecdote to analysis, right? Because we know change is scary. People freak out if we want to change anything in cities or in their neighborhoods. And so this is one of the models that kind of um, builds off the practice in Times Square uh, that you mentioned, Thomas, that um, my board chair, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who was responsible for the transportation agency under Mike Bloomberg, um, this was kind of a strategy that we're now, she's our board chair, so we're taking these strategies around the world. But what they did was it, it was essentially kind of turning into a, a complete disaster, right? Times Square, the center of Manhattan and New York, was dangerous and, you know, a, a complete disaster to be there. And you essentially had, I think it's 89% of the people there were pedestrians, people walking, but 89% of the space was given over to private vehicles. So, of course, you know, if anyone proposes, you know, 10 years ago, a decade ago, to close one of the busiest intersections in the world, everyone's going to think you're completely insane and need to go into some form of institution. Um, but they, you know, they stuck with it and they said, look, let's do it, let's trial it, and let's measure the impact. Mike Bloomberg's a really big numbers data guy. And what was quite incredible was that, that, fear of change was slightly reduced. And, you know, of course, you're still getting the taxi driver saying, oh, it's a nightmare, now I can't get across town. But you were able to have a fair and more equitable conversation because actually you could look at the numbers that said, you know what, the air quality is improved, less people are getting hit and being injured. Buses are actually moving more efficiently. Businesses are doing better. Qualitatively, everybody's enjoying this a lot more. Um, and they prefer it and they want it to become permanent. And so that was kind of a, a, you know, then able to be scaled up throughout New York City to not only be in the middle of Manhattan, but actually really look at providing public spaces through transforming streets in neighborhoods of need that didn't have a lot of access to public space. So, yeah, so that's kind of our general work. And we certainly hope that we're, you know, we're excited to keep working with cities around the world, making sure that, although a little less travel doing this nowadays, um, but helping them kind of fight for safer and healthier and more sustainable and more equitable cities is our kind of big mission. Oh, cool. I really, I found that really interesting because um, a big topic of conversation last weekend, I guess all the time was around the pedestrianisation of Courtney Place. I don't know if you saw a lot about that, but I guess it's kind of similar there in that we're trying to showcase to people how it can be more beneficial if it's more of a people-centred place. And just um, because at the beginning of your quarter, you mentioned Ian Athfield, I was just wondering very quickly if you had any thoughts about the Central Library. Are you a, a scrap it or save it person? Oh, look, I, I haven't. I need to probably be a bit more up to date with what's um, the latest of what's been happening there. I know it's really damaged from the from the earthquakes, I understand. And so it's a big, a big decision right now. Um, but I, you know, it, it's certainly an incredibly important place in the city is how you think about that civic heart. And I know, you know, that was... Um, Ath was a phenomenal um, kind of mentor to me in terms of how he 
you know, started bringing a lot of that thinking into, into New Zealand cities. So um, I won't give any direct comment on it without um, being totally informed, but no, I, say, I know it's a really critical um, part of the city and needs a lot of attention. No, awesome. And I'll, I'll definitely be um, reaching out to have a corded with you around pedestrianisation stuff here in Wellington as well. So awesome to connect with you and thank you for your corded or. Now we're moving on to the Bish Mullet, Mr. Chris Bishop, Hutt's very own. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Um, I've known Chris, what, two years now? He was really supportive of me when I was the president of Vic Uni. Um, so really appreciate um, having you on here, Chris. Um, so my kind of quick fire question for you is about transport and what kind of stuff you have been able to do in parliament around that, but also just wanted to understand a bit about how you balance your obligations to your local electorate, uh, to your to the country as a member of parliament, and then also to um, your political party, the National Party. And thank you for coming on and joining us. Oh, good evening. Thanks very much for having me on. It's um, great to be here. And I've just even in the half an hour we've been talking, I've um, learned quite a lot, so that's really cool. Um, let me just start by saying that, um, you know, I, I don't know everything about transport. I would not consider myself an expert in the slightest. And I think it's, you know, actually really important that politicians acknowledge that. Politicians come into parliament uh, you know, sort of, I suppose some people come in as experts in particular fields, but most don't. Most come in as generalists and you end up in portfolios and, um, you, you know, you have to listen and learn. And I think that's really important. And one of my things that I've been trying to do as the National Party Transport Spokesperson is do that over the last, uh, oh, it's coming up to a year now that I've been the Transport Spokesperson and hopefully I will be um, for quite a lot longer because, you know, I, I think like others have said, uh, transport um, and you know, urban design, the way in which we design our cities and, and our country is, is critical for on so many levels, whether it's safety or our economy or emissions. And uh, I'm on a bit of a journey. So let me just start by saying that. So I don't know everything, but the, the thing I would say is that I know our cities can and should work better than they do right now. And uh, you know, I, I am someone who's fortunate enough to have traveled you know, reasonably extensively all over the world, Europe, the States, um, lots of parts of Asia, everything from Vietnam to Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, and, you know, I know, I know that, you know, what cities um, can do better and, you know, what Wellington and Auckland and Christchurch and, and some of our um, smaller cities um, can, can do. And um, I think it's pretty clear to everyone, uh, I suspect on this panel, but probably most New Zealanders, that um, our cities are, you know, somewhat dysfunctional at the moment, uh, and uh, we need to we need to do better. And so that's kind of my, I suppose, not really a principle, but one of my guiding kind of aims uh, when it comes to formulating national party transport policy uh, is make our cities work better. And um, I think one of the things that um, goes underappreciated, um, probably not by people on this panel, but generally in the public, I suspect, is um, the connection between uh, transport. Uh, and um, housing affordability, for example, which is another something that I'm uh, really passionate about. And, uh, you know, we have got ourselves into a situation uh, in New Zealand, um, particularly in, in Auckland and Wellington, where uh, housing is just totally unaffordable for people like you, Tam, uh, and, and people of your age and your situation. Uh, but basically, people of my age and below, uh, housing is just totally unaffordable. And um, something has gone deeply wrong in our, in our country where uh, the average uh, house in Auckland is 10 times uh, the average median income. Um, so there's a ratio of 10 uh, for the average house, from median house to, to household income. Uh, it's 10 in Auckland, it's you know eight, whatever it is, in Wellington. Uh, where I come from in Lower Hutt, which used to be uh, the sort of bastion of first home buyers uh, and you know um, middle-class families uh, and people um, getting on the property ladder, uh, you know, the average, um, in the, the, the average um, house to income ratio uh, is about 6.5. Uh, heading up towards seven uh, and that's just totally um, outrageous and um, you know one of the things that I'm um, really keen to try and address is solving our transport issues but also solving our housing issues at the same time. So um, you know I, I am from Lower Hutt and you know one of the great things about being from Lower Hutt is we are um, blessed with a relatively good uh, public transport system in comparison to other parts of the country uh, and Lower Hutt in some senses um, you know was a uh, a city where transport and housing were, uh, if you look at the history, um, sort of built in an integrated way. So we built the um, Waterloo, well, the, the main Hutt Valley, or the second main Hutt Valley train line down the eastern side of the Hutt Valley, and we built housing around it in Nainai and Apuni and Taita, 
uh, Pumare all the way up to um, to Stokes Valley, and um, uh, you know we, the 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 what we've ended up with now is quite a good uh, train system. Uh, we used to have quite a good uh, bus system uh, that's uh, been fixed uh, by Thomas, I know, uh, and others. Uh, and um, so I know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a great lover, a believer in public transport. I take the train frequently. I didn't own a car till I was 31. Uh, I didn't get my license till I was 28. Uh, so I took the train to and from school. Uh, and I suppose uh, one of the things I would say is that we need to um, we need to decongest our cities. We need to make our transport system safer so that 350 people don't die on our roads every year, as I think Guy mentioned. We need to give people options around mobility, around how they get uh, around the cities that they live in. Uh, and um, I'm really interested in hearing what Oliver's got to say about micro mobility, because I'm a big fan of scooters. Uh, and we need to get our emissions um, down as well. And uh, all of those things have to happen, uh, you know, sort of not at least simultaneously, but at least um, contemporaneously. Let me just finish by saying um, my belief is that we've underinvested in transport and our infrastructure generally for years in New Zealand. There's lots of different reasons for that, which we could go into if we wanted to, but um, we need a huge amount of investment on lot, multiple different levels. Uh, and it needs to be uh, multimodal as well. And, uh, you know, the National Party uh, has this, um, I suppose, perception out there that we are just the party of roads. We build big, big fat motorways all around the country. Uh, and uh, and that is, that is true up to a certain level, but um, you can't build motorways forever. You know, you run out of motorway space and they're very expensive. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, you need to build uh, things like, um, you know, rap rapid transit that gets people around cities and in Auckland and Wellington that is increasing in Christchurch to some extent, that is uh, increasingly going to be uh, the answer because it's that's, that's I mean, you, everyone on this panel knows this, that's uh, those um, transport solutions that have got the capacity and, um, you know, I can't wait till the city rail link opens in Auckland uh, and, uh, you know, we you know, um, massively increase the capacity of the Auckland train network, for example. We need to do more uh, on trains in Auckland. Um, but the other thing I'd say is just um, in defence of roads is that different cities and regions need different things in New Zealand. Um, the, the simple reality is that there are lots of parts of the country in New Zealand uh, that are connected by roads uh, and always will be. And it's always going to be a really important part of the transport network. Not so much in Auckland and Wellington, um, but in you know, more of our rural and provincial cities, uh, roads are going to be critically important. And uh, you know, ex expressways have their place. Uh, and you know, the National Party will always continue to advocate for that. So just to finally um, answer your question, Tam, about how uh, I balance it all up. Um, yep, it's a bit tricky. We're working on our transport plans at the moment um, in um, in Wellington and the country. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, there's not, there's not going to be a particular bias towards the Hutt Valley or anything for my marginal seat, uh, much as I would like there to be. Uh, so uh, what, what we do is look at what different cities and different regions need. Uh, and um, I, I think you, what you'll see from us is, well, I think it'll be a pretty exciting plan, actually. And I think it will uh, maybe surprise quite a few people with what some of the things we're proposing. Don't want to give, give away too much. Uh, but I think people will be surprised by um, what we are looking at and surprised by the package we're able to put together. Um, and um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there for now. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, you got me uh, very excited about the National Party transport plan now, which is something I didn't think I was necessarily going to say uh, on the Zoom. But um, anyway. So I'm going to go to Oliver now. Uh, Oliver is kind of like uh, New Zealand's micro mobility guy. So I wanted to ask you, Oliver, what is micro mobility and why do you think it's important? Hang on, man, you got to unmute yourself. Sorry. Oh, Apologies. No, no, we're good. Okay. We good? You can hear me? Yeah, cool. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tam. And, and, and thanks, Thomas. I have been watching uh, a lot of these uh, town halls and getting really excited. I think you guys are leading the way on, on a lot of conversations that I'm really excited that we're having in New Zealand. Um, and I just, especially tonight, just obviously, this is an area that I care a lot about. Um, so it's really cool to, to hear the different perspectives. Uh, and like Bish, I'm learning a lot as well. Um, 
So micromobility, what is it and why is it important? Um, I, I run a podcast and a global conference series on something called micromobility and we, we define it as lightweight electric mobility. Um, so that's sort of anything from an electric scooter all the way up through to like electric covered pods that are about 500 kgs. Um, things that aren't cars, but would go around urban spaces um, and, and be propelled. Um, and the reason that we think they're really interesting is that we're seeing a huge amount of growth of these vehicles. Uh, and when I say massive growth, like in New Zealand, we saw 100% year on year growth of electric bikes last year. Um, and that's actually 100% off 100% off the year before. Um, at 67,000 bikes or so um, that we sold last year, we're on track to sell more of those uh, electric bikes than we will new cars uh, either this year or next year. So we're actually starting to see a huge number of these vehicles on the roads in New Zealand. Um, and I just think that that is it's really profound because they're not, uh, most people kind of think of electric bikes as being, oh, it's just like a bike, but they're not. They're kind of almost like a new vehicle class. Um, and, and most people kind of have experienced it in the sense that it's a scooter, but um, that kind of the public scooters, the flamingos and the giant jumps and the limes are really actually a relatively small part of the, the import. We've, we've got about, that's kind of only about 5% of what we're importing at, at the moment. So why are they important? Well, if we look at how Kiwis travel, um, only you know about 50% of our trips are less than five kilometers ballpark. Um, so most of our trips are actually short trips. And yet we've kind of had a very blunt tool of the car for a really long time, as Patrick and, and others have mentioned, uh, where we've just kind of defaulted to using the car for everything. Um, and, and why these vehicles are interesting is that they're sort of like, um, you know, like they're, they're like having a mobile phone uh, or like a smartphone to a, to a laptop. You know, you use the laptop for certain things and then you come along and you have the smartphone, which you use for certain things as well. Um, they're also really cheap. So they're about a quarter you know, a quarter of the cost of running a car on a per kilometer basis. Um, and they're small, so they can move through our cities really easily. Um, in New Zealand, we have 80% of our population living in cities, and yet most of our mode share in those cities, uh, 60 to 70% of trips taken are in a car. So, you know, these new vehicles, as they're starting to come in and they're rapidly growing and getting really exciting because they allow us to get across the cities really fast. And actually in Auckland and in Wellington, it's probably the fastest way to get around uh, e-bikes or, or, or e-scooters. Um, and so kind of, as I see these new vehicles coming, they're really additive to the existing vehicle base. And, you know, I, I have a car, I love using my car. I think it's awesome. And I will use it when I go out of the city and I will drive somewhere. But when I'm getting around in, in, in most of the city, I want to use the vehicle that's best suited to that. Um, and so we can see that kind of, you know, at the moment, they're not perfect. You know, if it rains, you get wet and all these sort of things. But like the cell phones of the early era, um, you know, the batteries were crap, the cameras never really worked, or they kind of were blurry and all that sort of stuff. All of that's going to massively improve. You'll get new vehicles that'll come along that kind of, you know, they'll have covers on them. They'll have uh, lots of range. They'll be able to get you around quickly. Some of them will self-drive themselves because they'll have autonomous on them. Um, all of that is really exciting. And they're also really paired well with mobility as a service. So this idea of being able to, you know, have that as your primary vehicle, but then uh, go and get Ubers or take a bus or um, get to, you know, um, uh, get an autonomous car in the future, if that comes comes to be, um, to be able to get around so that you don't need to own a car. You can have a vehicle that kind of suits the majority of your trips. Um, and, and our thesis in the, in the podcast is that this will happen globally. Like we're kind of, uh, it's a really exciting conversation for New Zealand, I think, because until now, especially around bike lanes, the conversation has been like, you know, if we build it, they'll come. Um, hopefully, and in some cases it hasn't happened. Um, but with these vehicles, we've got the huge sales force, you know, the, the force of these sales coming through and people saying, I want safe infrastructure to go and operate them. I'm doing you a service. You don't have to build bloody tunnels. You don't have to build new motorways. You can, you know, we can do this for far cheaper. And I just think that that is a really exciting possibility. And uh, New Zealand is kind of uh, really taking to it and, and embracing it. So that's why it's exciting. Oh, so awesome. And um, if you're sitting there at home wondering like, wow, that was such an awesome explanation. That's because Oliver has a really awesome podcast called the Micro Mobility Podcast, um, which is the first time I actually kind of encountered um, Oliver's mahi and have learned so much since then. So thank you for that explanation. That's awesome. And we can get into a bit more of that later on. So Awesome. So that is kind of the first round of questions we've had for everybody. But now we're going to take um, a bit more of a more targeted look at um, 
everyone's kind of areas of expertise and what they're into and some of the work they've been doing over the last six months or so or over the span of their career sometimes I'm not sure when that happened I probably wasn't born no <laughs> just joking anyway um so I'm gonna start with you Sky and um I wanted to talk a bit about your streets for pandemic response and recovery it's been really topical again here in Wellington we're just getting I think we're deciding on our innovating streets package on Thursday which is our kind of government um, funded response to making the right um, space on streets for people to be able to safely travel to and from work uh, with they're not getting too close to other people whether that's walking biking scootering any of those kind of forms of um, transport so um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit a little bit more about that project and what you kind of expressed in that and um, whether you think we're seeing the necessary changes in cities throughout the world um, for us to actually make that kind of transport shift and to, like um, Oliver was saying, are people in these cities and urban centres, are do you think they're able to see the difference between using different devices or different options for different types of transport or do you think it is very much um, going to remain the same? Mm. Thanks, Timothy. Um, yeah, so just as a re little recap, we released part one of what we've called um, Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery about 10 days ago, and we're in the middle of working on part two of that, which will come out in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, one thing that NACTO does and GDCI does very strongly is produce this kind of design guidance, very technical guidance of, of how we transform our cities. Um, we're, we're being quite careful here and kind of calling this uh, more a resource than and a gu than guidance right now, just because we are when we look globally, there's so much emerging evidence still um, around the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, but in saying that, we understand that different cities around the world are on very different timelines of how they're the peak of the virus once they're kind of over that peak when they're in kind of emergency response versus recovery mode. And so we thought it was really important. We're strong believers in cities learning from each other. And, you know, we don't have, with the urgency of so many crises, we don't have the time to reinvent the wheel all the time. So, you know, we looked at, uh, at NACTO, we set up a transportation response centre, which was really kind of tracking a lot of the, the actions um, that different cities were taking around the world. Um, you know, we see cities in Europe, obviously we work closely with the city of Milan, for example, they were one of the very early devastating peaks of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then, you know, they kind of started shifting into recovery mode. Um, so we wanted to kind of put together this resource to help cities understand that whatever stage they're at, they can use the street as part of the solution, as an asset to help um, address the, the kind of physical distancing that is being required. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of, we need more space for kind of safe walking, for cycling. A lot of folks um, weren't driving as much or going as far. They were sticking more closely to their neighborhoods, um, you know, making sure that essential workers could get safely to work on public transport systems. Um, in New Zealand, the bulk of our, you know, a huge amount of us own cars, but many parts of the world, most people don't own cars. And so they really are very reliant on the public transit systems. So we wanted to pull together some of the kind of guidance around that um, as, as cities started kind of shifting from emergency response into recovery. We also wanted to make sure that cities kind of had this permission slip to start rethinking their streets to kind of define a new normal and not go back, you know, not drive for the status quo, not drive back towards business as usual. Um, and so that became about, you know, like we've been talking about, how do you kind of more fairly and equitably distribute space amongst different users? Um, if folks are, you know, cycling more, we've now got a, like a bike shortage around the world. I mean, it's, it's amazing in, in that tiny sense. Um, but to make sure we're kind of giving that space so that families can cycle together next to each other in a protected or take a, you know, a scooter or something or an e-bike, um, but in a safe space where they're protected. Um, if it's if it's higher speeds, starting to look at how markets can, who might be overcrowded and need more space could start to take the real estate of the street. Or when schools need to reopen, how do we kind of give kids and families and parents more space? 
Um, how can restaurants start to take some of that space and local businesses as we saw, we've seen here in New Zealand, right? We've seen some of this already and we're kind of ahead of the curve in that. Um, so we're really looking at, and, and then helping, helping also push for streets as space for protest, for fighting for social justice. Um, so some of this is coming, it's not released yet, it'll be coming in our upcoming uh, version and, and ensuring that we're prioritizing uh, vulnerable communities and those that need it most. So, you know, we, I think we're starting to see some really interesting solutions out there. I am an optimist, so I really hope, you know, when we look at some of the moves of London making some car-free areas or Paris kind of thinking about the 15-minute neighborhoods, um, Bogota, I don't know if you guys saw Bogota, the capital of Colombia, basically built, you know, hundreds of kilometers of a bike network. They've already got one of the leading bike networks overnight. They built this overnight, you know, and then have made that permanent. They've reduced the speed so that they're safer. Um, Milan repainting streets so that they've got more space for cyclists and walking and, and transit to move efficiently and safely. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing some of this in New Zealand, um, but I don't think we're seeing enough. I, I am an optimist, as I said, I, I think we need to push a lot harder. I think we we started tonight's call, um, Thomas, this kind of slight celebratory feeling that today New Zealand has zero active cases for COVID. But I think, you know, once we enjoy a little bit of that celebration, I think we very um, seriously have to come back and remind ourselves of the as I mentioned at the beginning, and I don't mean to sound depressing, but the layer upon layer upon layer of other global crises that we are facing with the climate challenge, with public health, and our, what we do in our cities and how we use our streets and how we invest our budgets in a fair and equitable way, like what we decide needs to be a public good that, you know, we have all these excuses in New Zealand that we're too small and we can't do this. It's not true, right? We don't, we don't, if we, if we think about public transit as a public good, then we can invest in that and, and really make that the heart and the backbone of our cities. We don't look to make money off our schools and our libraries, right? We look at European cities and public transport and public space is seen as a public good. So I am optimistic. I think we've got, a, we've got all the tools We've got all the evidence. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. We've got this luxury now of being able to look across the world and see examples from absolutely everywhere. But we cannot get lazy and we cannot stay silent and we have to keep fighting and it's not that easy. Um, if it was easy, if this kind of change that we're talking about was easy, then it would be done already. Um, but I think it's so fundamental that we, we elevate the great stuff and push it and make it grow and, uh, and I, I'm very excited about the potential that New Zealand has and New Zealand cities to to lead the way globally quite frankly I think we've done that with the COVID-19 crisis and I think there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be doing that in terms of urban design cities transportation mobility um, yeah so I'll stop there Oh, kia ora, Sky. That was so awesome. I'm going to, like a lot of times when we do these things, we think back, oh, I've just got to listen to that clip again and, we'll, we'll, you know, maybe we'll, we'll clip out that little bit and put it on its own. But yeah, it's, it's really great. I can hear them outside. They're, they're clapping. The live stream outside Vogelmore Bowling Club, they're clapping. I can also smell the, the smoke from the pizza oven as well. It's very... <laughs> Very Vogelmorn out here, um, but anyway, I was going to say the excited about these things. <laughs> no, it's great, it's fantastic. I was going to say, you know, the the point you're making though about how we could potentially um, provide some some leadership, provide an example um, for the rest of the world with our with our street design and with our sharing of space uh, on the on the roads and in the streets. I agree with that, you know, and I think that's the beautiful thing about the Innovating Streets package. It was already, it was already working its way through the system mm. uh, in New Zealand with the government when the pandemic kind of hit. And uh, basically people were like, well, yeah, we actually need this even more now during the pandemic. It could actually be a, uh, an absolute necessity for essential workers and for the rest of us to be able to continue working. So I think there's something in that. And now that we've uh, done so well with the coronavirus strategy, uh, it should give us even more impetus to kind of carry on with with greater determination to to advance uh, that that transformation of our uh, of our public space and our and our transport systems in our cities. 
So thinking a bit about uh, switching tack slightly from how we get around inside a city and how we design our streets, uh, I want to come to you, Anthony, and ask a little bit about how we get between our cities. And we talk, touched a little bit about this in the, in the opening round. But you know, when I came back to New Zealand, I lived overseas for a long time, like 16 years. And I, and I came home and one of the things that really struck me was, wow, if you, really, if you want to get around, you've got to get a plane. And there's heaps of planes and they're actually pretty cheap. I mean, they're not that cheap, but relatively speaking. Uh, and, or you've got to jump in your car and that's it really. Or you can, you can get a bus, yeah, but it's not great. And, uh, and there's trains that go in the regional areas. But um, I was really surprised that there was no regional and in, intercity rail network. And so I want to ask you, Anthony, what do we need to do? You've been thinking about this. I can see, we can see the, uh, the evidence of it behind you uh, on uh, your wall. What do we need to do to get people in New Zealand and the people who help to make these decisions to think that it is a genuine possibility for us to have an intercity rail network? What do we need to do? Well, one thing to say, and can you hear me okay now? Is it cool? One thing to say is that it did exist. Um, it's it's not, and, and often the the railway lines are still there, um, but it's not also not just rail. One thing that's really important to note is that until 1991, we had an interregional state provided bus system. So we made sure as a state that we had buses that reached every part of New Zealand. They also connected with with the rail system. Um, today we've got this situation. Where I'll, I'll give you an example. In Whanganui, if we were able to take a bus to Ohakune um, and connect to the train, you'd, you'd have an hour 20 bus ride, um, and then from Ohakune to um, Papakura Station, it's only five hours 10. So that's a six hours 40, you're almost starting to get competitive with the car travel time to Auckland. However, we have a bus service that goes from Whanganui to Ohakune, um, it arrives in Oakune at 12.45, and the train leaves at 12.30. Um, so we used to have things that talked to each other, and now we're used to this idea that these are all different um, companies. I, I think it, it, it has been a big hole, the interregional transport, and that's why I was so amazed with the Capital Connection um, train. My big message of Railland is that public transport rail both within and between cities in New Zealand, is not only possible, sometimes it already exists. Um, <laughs> but um, for, for me, what I'm really interested in at the moment is near-term, short-term, and medium-term stages that we can start doing now so that we can get people having positive interactions with our public transport um, and get people having really tangible options. You know, I, I lived in Auckland for seven years, and the whole time I was just looking forward to the city rail link. I'm like, let's, let's do it, let's do it. Um, but I look back now and I realize that the, thing that the things that have made the most um, difference to my life and which I'll remember were small things like the then council deciding to buy some not very attractive diesel trains for Auckland and increasing the frequency of buses in Auckland because that got more people using that system, it got the patronage up, and when, when it comes to, to then make the argument to build things like the city rail link or the electrification, it's much easier to make. Um, and I think using those stages, it's always good to think about the five, 10, 15, 30 year plans, and, and that's a big problem with trains is that there's a big infrastructure lag. Um, however, we shouldn't underestimate the resources that we do have, whether that's putting on a more comfortable and more convenient bus. Y you know, in, in Whanganui, we used to have a bus that went direct to Wellington via Foxton. It ran since the 1920s until the 1980s. But today, all our buses go through Palmerston North and they take four and a half hours where driving will take you two and a half. Um, the, the other thing that's really big for me at the moment it, is is to not let our focus on the long term make us blind to things that might be being demolished or eroded now. You know, the Silver Fern rail carriages I talked about um, in the song, actually, and Patrick might remember that when Greater Auckland suggested the regional rapid rail 
plan. They suggested an early stage like this, getting people on this, using the Silver Fern rail carriages to start an early testing service to Hamilton and Tauranga. It wasn't taken up. And those carriages are, be are being retired as we speak, I understand. But also last year, Hastings Station burnt down. Balclutha Station was demolished. So often our infrastructure that we do have um, is being destroyed in the same way that it was destroyed in the 90s by, by neglect. And the, the really big one for me now is that is Dunedin Railways. Um, because we know from, from the past few years how difficult it is to build an organisation that can run passenger services. I mean, you just look at Hamilton to Auckland. But right now in Dunedin, we have a company with more than 50 trained staff who know how to run passenger services, know how to do the ticketing, the marketing, all of that, um, and they're about to all lose their jobs. Um, so sometimes that we're focusing way into the future when there could be a real possibility of doing something by using all that expertise that exists um, in front of us to try something in the South Island. I, I mean, I, and there are tourism service, of course. I also think there's a lot of potential and taking tourism and saying, well, this is a tourist service and it's doing really well, but could we tweak this a little bit so that it's still a great bargain tourist experience for an overseas visitor or a, or a local now, but it also forms a transport function. If it, if it, if, and if it can give us some benefit for our transport goals, for our emission goals, maybe we can look at um, you know, cheaper pricing if you're only going between Tomaranui and Wakune, or, or um, if you're going from Levin to Palmerston North. If, you know, one of the great things about a train, as opposed to a plane, um, that goes from Wellington to Auckland, to me it's not that important, the, the people who will go from Wellington to Auckland. I'll do it, I'm tragic. But what's more important are the people who can take that from, say, Paikakariki to Palmerston North, or Palmerston North to Hamilton. It's like, a tr it's like a plane that stops many times. Yeah, kia ora, kia ora Anthony. I mean, I, I so agree. Like, whenever I do tweets about trains, especially with a picture of a train, namely a picture of the Hapua Whenua Viaduct, they are way more successful than any of my other tweets, which are totally useless. But so there is something out there in the in the world about trains and railways. And I think there's the there is the, the romanticism and the, the kind of nostalgia as well, which I know you're not really about necessarily, um, because you're a very practical forward-looking <laughs> guy um, based on that uh, analysis that you gave. But there is there is something there. And so I, I do hope that we'll be able to do that and convince the powers that be that there might be a role for, as you said, what are currently mainly tourist services to actually provide an alternative for, for, for commuting. Because from a climate perspective, you know, at some point, the, the cost benefit analysis, you know, I mean, we're probably, probably already there, really, if we were actually properly pricing carbon in terms of the, the, the cost uh, to the planet. But um, yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to say that, but uh, I'm going to kick the ball over to uh, Tam now for the next question. Yeah. No, that was awesome. Thank you. Cool to imagine, definitely just imagine what it might have been like and what it can be like. Um, cool. So going to go to Elisa Peter. Um, and I was really keen to hear from you about how we can reshape our towns and cities and their transport systems and urban design post COVID. And how can we do it in a way, if this is possible, uh, which um, centres or is built upon um, te tiriti, but also Māori design principles and if there are any Pacifica equivalents to those principles and what that might look like. Of course, there are probably equivalents given we're all whanaunga, but keen to hear your kōrero on that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's funny, I mean, I have to admit, when I read this question, um, alongside, of course, reading who the panelists were, I had a mild panic attack. Because um, I, I think it's such an important one. And, and in fact, I think it's something somebody could quite easily do a couple of PhDs on, re really like do some deep digging, a good amount of research. And I, I'm, I'm nervous the panic attack was because, um, because there's so many things I think that can be done. So where to start is kind of the question. And, um, 
you know, I really want to say thank you to, especially I think what Sky and, and Patrick have been saying tonight. Um, I mean, I've been a long time follower of a lot of what Patrick has said online. It's kind of mind blowing actually. But anyway, now I'm just fangirling. Um, anyway, back to point. Because the question around how to honor tetidity, I mean, <laughs> It, I, I'm asked this question a lot around the honouring of tetiriti. And what I mentioned earlier is something I will say again, just because I think it's important for people to hear it again and again so that it really implants itself in their brain. But first and foremost, to honour tetiriti waitangi is not something that Māori and Māori alone have to um, uphold. So often the, the struggles or the issues um, that are perceived around honouring tetiriti tend to sit on the shoulders of Māori people. That said, I think that there is a huge amount of work that can be done as tanga tetiriti, as an all non-Māori and Māori can do towards bettering our cities. The, the beautiful kind of the element of this nerdy conversation tonight that I'm really enjoying is that the fundamentals for me, why I like transport, granted I also love um, is because the infrastructure of our cities, like what Sky was basically saying, is what I would term to be the lifeblood of our built environment um, from a, from a human-made perspective. It's literally the veins that pulse around our, our built spaces. And I get nerdy about that because I think it's something that gets overlooked. Basically, what Patrick was saying earlier was that in the centralization of especially places like Auckland, where everything moves into the CBD on a daily basis, our poor communities are shifted outwards. I grew up in West Auckland in Tiatatu Peninsula, where uh, after eight o'clock in the morning, the only way to catch a bus into town was once an hour. Um, so if you missed the bus, you had to wait another hour and I'd miss my lecture and you know I was a chronic I slept in all the time so that was an issue for me I would drive to uni and I didn't need to not to mention it was an hour and 15 minute bus ride on what should be a 10 minute straight shot in no traffic it just you know it was such a shame that living in well then it was a poor community now it is a very gentrified community because it's it was sort of like the next point here because it's by the beach and everything in Auckland is expensive. And now the poor people that lived in Tiatatu have moved even further away. And it just it frustrates me because effectively overlooking infrastructure um, like it doesn't have a relationship to Tiriti or Waitangi is well it's it's doing our people a disservice. So that, that's kind of a, a blank statement I will make. Um, effectively, I think there's a whole lot of things that need to happen here. Um, I think within the industry, we need to recognize that one of the fundamental parts of Tetiriti is talking about equity. And this again has come up over and over. Um, it's about equity and it's really about partnerships, right? If you were to center conversations about infrastructure um, alongside conversations with mana whenua about equity, you would actually have a hugely different conversation. You would be talking about communities. You would talk, be talking about the safety of our children on the street. You would be talking about the fact that, you know, people need to be driving less and walking more. All of those things, um, you know, the constant building of takeaway shops that we drive through in South Auckland, which, you know, yay that they managed to get rid of one more KFC out there. But um, all of these things have a relationship. They're all interconnected. All of these facets are problematic and kind of, this is why this needs to be a thesis. I feel like they all need to be undone. But again, what I always come back to is it's about partnerships and it's about equity. I think, and I, I feel like often conversations around infrastructure and transport are always about money and about cars. 
And so people get a bit tired of them or they feel like it's something that doesn't relate to them. Even though just like buildings, we're literally interacting with cars in the street all the time. So my challenge to our Māori and Pacifica whānau too would be to engage somehow if you can. There are community groups that care about this sort of stuff. You can do reading about these sorts of kaupapa. You can watch stuff like this. You can listen to podcasts about micromobility. You can engage in those little ways. But I do also think that there is a very large system that is stacked against Māori and Pacifica people engaging in these conversations too, right? So that means that our industry needs to get better at growing Māori leadership, at growing Pacifica leadership, at engaging with Māori principles, at making space on the table for them to be there and to be seen and to have a voice. If you have a leadership table made up of all white people, who have grown up in middle-class communities, that is the way they will fundamentally tend to think about the way to design spaces. You don't have, it's, it's really simple. You don't have diverse voices at a table. You don't have diverse outcomes. So part of my wit or my challenge, I guess, to our industry is that we need to get better at lifting people up and into these we need to take down some of the barriers, things like the fact that the education system uh, does not teach much about Māori history, which means that it's harder for, you know, Māori and non-Māori, say, in architecture school, to learn about the history of the Pacific, which means they get discouraged, which means they drop out of architecture school, which means they don't go on to design buildings. Those are systemic failures inside of our system. And there are many, many, many systems that we need to think about holistically. So that, that's my issue with the question, not that there's anything wrong with the question, was just that there's, it's a multifaceted thing. You have to come at it from the ground up. Communities actually know about what's good for them. We do need to trust them and we do need to actually know that they have their best interests at heart but also that what they are talking about can be scaled up, can be thought about in a multi multimodal way, you know. Um, I, could, I could probably rant about this for ages and ages, but see, CRL, I love, I, I kind of love what's happened with CRL for lots and lots of reasons, because it has been a good example of getting mana whenua in early. So Māori were brought in at the beginning stages, they were said, they were they were um, sent out. A, I don't know if it would have been an RFP or an EOI or whatever the acronym at the time was, but effectively they were said they were told we are going to do this thing in our city and we want to know who wants to be involved. The technicalities of Auckland are that we have lots of iwi and hapu who have an interest in what's going on in our city. So from that we had eight um, representatives, eight iwi. Uh, hapu come forward and that has formed a kaitiaki forum that basically um, is there at a governance level helping to support everything else that happens in CRL and that informed the design principles that have been used um, which are most, a lot of people will know this and you can do your own research but the Paranga Māori design principles um, were used in the early stages to have really robust conversations with those representatives of mana whenua in Auckland to say hey how do we get your stories into this but also how do we get your people into this space you know I've been in some of those meetings where they're saying we want to make sure that the procurement process actually factors in the fact that these contractors that are wanting to work on this job are hiring Māori and Pacific staff what are their what are their, um, you know, processes around ensuring equity and ensuring diversity? It's, it's happening at every level of the construction uh, process for CRL. And that is because at the very beginning, mana whenua were brought in to sit alongside those decision-making processes. And it's because mana whenua fundamentally are driven by a values-based pro um, process 
not one looking at the bottom line only. Because like Sky said, you know, you can only look at the bottom line, I think, well, I'm badly paraphrasing you, but and, and that will drive a particular set of outcomes. But if you're actually looking at the qualitative data, you will actually get better bottom line outcomes in the end anyway. That's the long-term goal. But the short-term making changes that people do find difficult um, to start with is incredibly important. And it's just a fundamental thing. Honoring the treaty is about equity and it's about partnership. I, I couldn't underscore it in any other way. You, you, I think it becomes scary and or complicated when you start realizing how systemic the issues are and how many issues you want to take on. But that's why you have panels of people like this who have huge amounts of knowledge across many, many things who have um, an ability to influence government, to influence people riding bikes, to influence boards and like, you know, have conversations in New York. I've currently been asked to contribute to policy making in LA because they are looking at how they involve their indigenous people in um, basically in their built environment in a city that last year I was told by a few members of their design community who I will not mention that indigenous people didn't exist in LA. Um, you know, these conversations are now becoming more and more global and New Zealand may be little, but we're actually not immune to the issues, but also we can take on just as many like great learnings from our cities overseas. So yeah, anyway, that's probably my testimony slash TED talk. We could go on for ages and ages, but um, that's how I badly answer your question. <laughs> Oh, that was amazing. Kia ora, Lisa Feta, Tina Kwe. That was so, so good again, and so much material. And yeah, I mean, I, I think your point about cognitive diversity, having the people in the room, having the communities represented from the beginning is so important. And we were just thinking, the two of us, that people with disabilities uh, and also elderly people uh, and other people with different needs, we need to have them in the conversation as well. There are a lot of people who experience streets very differently to say me uh, or other people who are watching and yeah it's just so critical that we have those voices and, yeah, and I, I was told today just today annoyingly by uh, <clears throat> someone that uh, you know boards these days only want uh, you if you're brown and you're a woman and I just it bugged me but I also thought every other board I've ever looked at has been made up of Pakistan men and you know I've also been told by other male friends that they don't realize the realities of what it's like to be a mother on the street till they had their own kid and they're trying to negotiate with a pram. I'm like, well, you know, if you invited, say, a mother to give you some of that feedback, you wouldn't have to go about the long route of having a child to realize <laughs> actually some of that um, immediate feedback you can have. It's this really simple, and I, I know it sounds stupid to say, but that diversity on the table, just you, you literally can't go past it. <laughs> Eliza, Bita, just, uh, um, I was going to mention this earlier, but I forgot, we're also about to release, well, soonish, another um, guide, set of guidance called Streets for Kids. So it's also about looking at making sure, yes, we've got elderly and, you know, that we're looking at that diversity of voices and engagement. Um, yes. Because again, you know, when a, when a traffic engineer is sitting behind a, a computer screen, they're not thinking about that. And we look at public transport as a trip from here to here, but the reality of trip chaining and a more complex daily schedule and different hours is, um, you know, so important when we're thinking about the, the functioning of our cities. So, Hugely. But, we should we, be having an entire, like, conference about this particular topic but let's do it a digression. <laughs> Uh, this is our greatest challenge with Aotearoa Town Hall is the, mm -hmm. the density and the richness of the material that we um, that we that we have to get through. But so I'm gonna I'm gonna try and move us on a bit, um, but because we've got to try to get through uh, our next two last two sort of prepared questions. No, three more, three more questions. Goodness, we're we're slightly running over time. But um, Patrick, I wanted to come to you. Um, Sometimes when we think of all these things that we want to do and all the challenges and obstacles in front of us, it does feel like it's taking 
too long uh, a bit. Uh, and I, but on the other hand, if someone like you can get appointed to the board of uh, NZTA Waka Kotahi, then some things might must be going in the right direction. So I wondered if you could just tell us what are the positive things you're seeing in terms of the way this the great ship uh, Aotearoa Transport Systems is is moving around. Uh, well, no pressure. You know, I, I've got to change rule myself. Um, thank you for that. And then uh, to repeat, to sort of Tatako Elisabetta, diversity comes in all sorts of shapes. And uh, there's a, you know, we're, if we're talking about the future or planning anything, that is essentially an imaginative act. And you don't want a room only with the engineers, lawyers, and accountants to do that. And that it, that is. Uh, a habit we're in with with governance to to stick to those stem or those very um, legalistic types of thinkers and, and diversity of all kinds is required and and there's really good study about this at the governance level that and and almost in a way you know New Zealand always comes within the top three of the least corrupt societies in the world right um, but I think and this is largely a function of a small and relatively homogenous community, is that there is a form of, of almost invisible corruption we have here, which is simply groupthink. If everybody's sitting around the table all just agree, uh, then they will just, or one of the great dangers for the organisation, this is well studied, is that they'll, they'll skip arm and arm into the minefield that none of them can see. Right, this this is a real problem. So, um, a, a longitudinal study on boards showed that if the more diverse board you have, um, your meet your meetings will be a little less harmonious, but the performance of the company or the or the public body will be much more successful because uh, things are nutted out in the room rather than happening as a big surprise um, to that organisation. So, um, hopefully, I'm bringing value in that room. Now, th there is a, there's a lot, actually, that's very exciting at Waka Kotahi at the moment, um, and, and not all of which I can talk about, um, but we, we've already mentioned one right now, which is Innovating Streets, which is uh, I'm incredibly excited about. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a little too informed as it is, I think, Chris. <laughs> um, Innovating Streets is, is incredibly powerful. It's a tiny little speck of our budget, but we, we've gone out to communities all across New Zealand and just been flooded with response from, from the ground up. This, so this is, instead of turning up with a massive piece of infrastructure, this is asking people small changes that they'd love to see funded. And, and this is a really big change uh, for the agency because until recently, we didn't even contribute anything to footpaths. We would, we would co-fund with the local authority the tarmac, but we would stop at the curb. Uh, that's been fixed, luckily. Um, but now with Innovating Streets, we're actually really helping people reimagine their spaces. And I, I, I guess there's a couple of things I want to say about, because it's, change is my thing. It's, I'm a student of change and I'm impatient for change, <laughs> um, but things take a long time. There's a, a, a whakatoki, that I really like, which is kamua kamuri, which is a, 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 the idea of walking backwards into the into the future. In other words, we see we can see the past, we understand the past, but the, the future is unwritten, and we have you know imperfect knowledge of it. And, and this is kind of the problem of um, uh, the, the sort of status quo. Most people actually really struggle to imagine the built environment changing. They just accept it. As it is, and it and and they also assume that its current state was kind of inevitable. It was always going to be like this, um, whereas that isn't the case at all. And and to 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 quote another very topical person, uh, the English economist Keynes, he, he said the problem is not in finding new ideas; it is in getting away from the old ones. Uh, and and. That is, is especially the case because old ideas, especially at the end of, of, of their lives, are often embodied in regulations uh, and not just in habits and people's thinking, but also all the way embedded all the way through organizations and, and things. And I think we're seeing that very strongly at the moment. Um, and we, when we talk about urban form, it isn't, it isn't simply the transport decisions, but things like planning rules, um, you know, that, that actually ban 
how people would like to live in, in many ways. And we have to always unpick these things. And there's a kind of a tragedy that when when we're faced with a, a, a an era with a great deal of discontinuity like we are now when we're really at the end of the uh, industrial revolution we're at the end of the age of combustion um and and certainly at the end of the motordom experiment of, of the second half of the last century we've now got all of those regulations embedded in in all of our everything we do and it's um it's a really interesting problem to unpick them but i'd also like to um mention another thing that that you were saying, Elizabeth, which is about value. Um, obviously, at Waka Kotahi, we spend an enormous amount of time um, looking at numbers written on pages and screens. So these are financial issues, right? But there's the real question is what is the economic value? Um, the, the, the harsh reality of a, a PL, you know, do we have the cash? Can we do this thing? is very real, but we do need the greater thing is to really look at, uh, at the full value and we don't throughout the transport system we do a whole lot of discounting we don't count everything and you know not everything um, we do count counts and and what and what you measure you ma you manage right so there's there's a lot of challenges all the way through it especially as we uh, face the carbon act coming in um, and the enormous problem of our cities um, uh, you know, especially say Wellington in particular, which, which almost has no farmland. So the emissions uh, picture in Wellington is almost all transport. So th this, in, in, over the next decade, we have to completely transform this. Yet um, the agency has the, uh, the, you know, our source of income from the, the National and Transport Fund is, is uh, goes up if more people drive. So there's a tension between what we need to do and how we can fund it. And these are these are really incredibly serious and really interesting um, problems. Uh, I, and I would like to touch also touch on briefly about um, CRL because um, I look, I'm completely susceptible to big pieces of infrastructure as well. Uh, but that one, there's a, there's a couple of things that I really critical about that. One is, here's a word, and I think, uh, forgive me, Chris, but um, politicians use this word a lot. They, um, they say something will be transformational. Now, very few things are. Most things are kind of incremental, and that's generally quite good, because sometimes you don't want to be transformed in the way that fate can transform you, right? <laughs> um, but this will be, and it will be transformational in the way that the last thing truly transformation, transformational thing in Auckland, which was the Harbour Bridge was. But also it's got a, it's going to be transformational culturally, as you mentioned. And I think that this is really, really important. Um, I, I had a sort of a, um, an epiphany on, on a train um, on the Eastern Line a couple of years ago, where I looked around the interior of the, of the train. And the interesting thing about the Eastern Line is that it goes through Glen Innes and then it and then it gets to King's College and you know it's got this really interesting um, social landscape it travels through. And I, and I realized that the, the inside of this um, late model European vehicle, electric, modern and and was this extraordinary array of people. There was a Sikh with a turban and there was a you know dude in a suit and there were it was a complete cross section and perfectly harmonious. Homies from GI and, and, and a whole bunch of uh, Kings boys and blazers. And I, I realized that this really, this is a social and communal space um, of incredibly high quality. So it's the reverse of a recent experience I had um, in Chicago, uh, where we caught the train um, there. And I thought, this is the richest country on the earth. Right, this place is you know unfathomably wealthy, and this is the shittiest train I've ever been on in my life, um, and it seemed to me it's intentionally so, right? Like it, it, it it's almost like a, a conscious idea. This is this is public, so it must be bad, um, or or at least uh, maybe unconsciously, but it was so sort of consistent. Um, and I, and I thought we really are doing something really good with this piece of public realm uh, in Auckland. This, you know, and I, th there's an opportunity here to spread this to more 
this kind of quality of public realm. I mean, there may have been a whole lot of people on that train that this is the only time they've ever been in a late model European vehicle, right? And yet they can access it at the same dollar eighty that I did, and there's no Coro Club, there's no classes, right? It's it's completely level, um, and it was a, that was a really sort of great experience. And I I think I gave um, Chris a, a question in the house out of it by calling it a um, a decolonized space, which of course is a bit of a you know liberal <laughs> speak that works well in the chamber, I'm sure. Um, so I think there's a, a great deal to to be excited about, and but you know I think we have no excuse in New Zealand. We, we start with an enormous amount of advantages, and we don't have half of the problems that the rest of the world faces. I mean, at all. Uh, so um, you know I'm, I'm extremely excited about what we can achieve in this space, and especially by starting at the bottom and 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 thinking uh, differently and counting things, measuring things differently, uh, and responding bravely to enormous challenges like uh, climate change, which, you know, this COVID, I think, is a little um, a walk in the park compared to what we're going to be facing. It's going to be like a series of them accumulating, um, you know, challenges. I mean, lower heart, Chris, is, uh, you know, sea level rise is <clears throat> not going to be kind to lower heart. So, um, or Rongatai. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a hell of a lot to be getting on with and we will have to get quicker. <laughs> I don't know how, because we also need to be evidence-based. We need to be, we need to make sure, you know, uh, the agency and our colleagues at the ministry certainly don't do anything uh, on a whim. Um, we, you know, uh, accrue evidence and and data and um, look at it this way and that way and um, and then ultimately get told to do something else by our masters. But um, th you know that's that's how it rolls. Um, and uh, it is a tremendously interesting being inside that room. Um, but it, it, it's a responsibility for the entire uh, bubble of five million uh, to to change. And, and and to dry it to you know work out that change i, I look i could keep going here um <laughs> quite some time because I, I think it is important to, to touch on a number of things i mean the cities of the very center of the cities are relatively straightforward in a lot of ways um especially once you can persuade shopkeepers who turn out to be the most difficult um, species on the planet i think to move um that loitering is more valuable than motoring that someone uh, walking by their shop is much more valuable to them than someone driving through their neighborhood uh, on the way to somewhere else. But it's suburbia is, and New Zealand is essentially suburban, is, is prime, predominantly suburban. And that problem is a, is a greater problem because, um, and that's where I grew up, for example, and I know that to leave the house was to grab the car keys um, in suburban Auckland. Uh, and, and for good reason, because people aren't stupid. Uh, there was nowhere safe to ride a bike. There was nowhere close to walk to. Uh, and there was no transit of any quality or frequency. So what's she gonna do? So it's not a question of, of, of just demanding people change at all. It's give it, offer, offering them. People are, um, uh, the economists would call it, they're rational actors. You know, they, they, will, they will do. Um, what's best for them and everybody is an expert on their own transport right their own um, needs the problem with that and it's one we all face is that that doesn't scale like what works for you in a city or what works for your routine doesn't scale to everyone um, and 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 uh, communities and cities are, are collectives of us all um, as for the uh, the rural world uh, I, we really, I think, need to be working out a way to electrify their uh, vehicles because they will—they're not—they're not going to be using mass transit. Um, we really need to prioritise that, and I would—that's my gift to you, Chris. Um, if the National Party came out with a uh, a way to to uh, <coughs> to help the uh, rural sector get 
um, onto the electrification chain, they might break a, um, uh, a, a problem there. Because people who drive, someone who drives, uh, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers a day, uh, it's much more valuable for all of us that their vehicle is electrified than mine. I have a, um, a barely used car sitting in a, in a driveway in, in Auckland, which um, I just, like Oliver, used to leave town occasionally. Um, it's, it, I, that's not a priority for, for that to be um, turned into a Tesla, really, in, in terms of emissions. So um, there's, there's so many there's so many levels we can <coughs> we could go into this here, and I better give someone else a go. Kia ora, Patrick. And there's there's a, there was again so much material there, and uh, some some daunting challenges, but also some really hopeful signs and and some encouraging signs. And one of the encouraging signs I thought was the way you, as a board member of uh, Waka Kotahi NZTA, was interacting with potentially a future transport minister um, on the maybe not obviously this year. I mean maybe this year, but you know at some point in the future we'll just see how it all see how it all pans out. You know, I mean the polls, the polls, whatever. But um, yeah. So uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, I'm going to kick it over to Tam, who's going to you know, go next. Yeah, well, I can see but the bush has got um, has unmuted, but I'm actually going to pass it over to you so you can you can respond how you want and then jump into the question. Look, so I'm, a, I'm an undecided independent voter, despite what people think and believe. I swear I am. I'm working on it. No, mem no memberships, no nothing, right? Okay, so I'm making my mind up. So I... Obviously, being in Wellington City Council, transport is one of you know the really key issues. So I want to understand what um, what you're going to offer, what you have to offer as the Minister of Transport. What are you going to do? And and obviously, you're part of you know one of the key main parties, so you've got a big captive audience. So um, yeah, I'm keen to hear about what your plans are and, and how you're going to kind of take that portfolio. Uh, well, thank you. Um, well, yeah, I'm not going to give you our, our, package and our package and our plans tonight, but I will just make a couple of comments. Um, firstly, can I just um, say, um, Anthony, I'm really sorry I didn't see uh, Railland. Um, I saw it advertised and um, ironically enough, I tried to get down uh, and see, see it, um, but the flights didn't work. <laughs> ironically enough, um, with my diary and just with when it started and the times of day and getting to and from and all the rest of it. I tried really hard because it looked really fascinating and um, one of the things I'm really interested in, in uh, you know, other than transport, obviously, uh, and my marginal seat is, um, is New Zealand political and economic history. And so, um, you know, and I find the history of the railway is really fascinating. So uh, I really wanted to go and see that. So I'm really sorry I couldn't make it. I hope you bring it back. And if you do, I will, I will be there as long as the flights work um, and my schedule permits. Um, Patrick, uh, thank you for your Koro. Um, can I... Um, can I just say that your Twitter account provides many opportunities to uh, <laughs> use, uh, and you might have noticed that I have not, um, I think maybe with one exception, done that, um, because I, I, frankly, I think um, personalities, it's not really about personalities when it comes to transport, it should be about policy. And I decided when I became an MP that one of the things I was gonna do was be about policy, first and foremost, uh, and I, tried pretty hard to stick to that. I mean, not obviously um, people, not everyone's imperfect and I'm imperfect like everyone else, but uh, I think, um, so I just, yeah, I'll just leave it there, I suppose. Um, uh, so yeah, so look, in terms of where we're going, a couple of things that, you know, are not settled policy yet, but I did want to mention that I think um, will help with, I, I think, I think the, look, I, I think the, the greatest challenge facing Auckland and Wellington is congestion. Um, and just the amount of time it takes to get around our cities, and the economic cost of that is ginormous. The estimates are, you know, range from you know one to two billion. You know, doesn't really matter what it is. Everyone knows that it's big, um, and uh, it's particularly acute in Auckland, but Wellington is um, equally congested as well. And um, you know, like even here in the hut, um, uh, which um, and just on the hut. Um, I think it was Patrick who made the comment about sea level rise. Uh, we live in Petone, uh, 150 metres from the beach. Uh, so we are very acutely aware of uh, sea level rise from where we are. Uh, so well said. Um, but yeah, even in Petone, just in the six years we've been living here, the you know the um, congestion has got um, extremely um, bad. So uh, I, I think that's the great challenge facing our cities. Um, and we um, have, we're going to propose a few things uh, to deal with that. The first is, if you talk to any economist, uh, or pretty much any economist worth their salt, they will tell you that putting a price on 
congestion, managing demand in our roads is the right way to uh, go about uh, doing that. And so uh, we have pushed the boat out a bit on congestion pricing. Um, you know, it's just nuts that it costs the same to use the Hutt motorway at midnight when no one wants to use the road other than me coming back from Parliament. Um, uh, then it does at 7 a.m. in the morning when everyone um, traveling from Johnsonville or Lower Hutt or Upper Hutt wants to get on the motorway. Uh, and, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, the result of that is queuing uh, and everyone waiting. Uh, and, um, you know, normally when we have, um, you know, excess demand like that, you put a price on it and um, you can uh, use the price mechanism to make sure that people make choices around what transport modes they use, but also they can travel at different times of day. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I think it's a pretty familiar territory to many people on the panel. So uh, we, we are going to push the boat out a bit on that. It's not settled policy yet. We put it in our discussion document at the end of last year. Pretty much, interestingly, quite broad consensus around every policymaker I talk to, uh, and also the mayors of Auckland and Wellington uh, on this, both Andy Foster, the mayor of Wellington, and Phil Goff, the mayor of Auckland, is in favour of this. Uh, we are as well. Um, Phil Twyford, the transport minister, has in the past expressed quite a degree of enthusiasm for it. He seems to have gone a bit um, less enthusiastic in the last little while, I'm not quite sure why, um, but you know, I, I think he intellectually gets it. Uh, the other thing I'd say about Phil is that we have our differences around delivery, but I, I think um, you know, he, he, he basically gets the great challenge facing New Zealand cities, um, which, is dealing with, which is the connection between housing, housing and uh, transport and uh, creating newer ways of infrastructure financing, for example, to make sure that cities can grow out and up. Uh, the great challenges around planning in the inner cities, and he's got um, some proposals around urban development, which we largely support. Uh, to do that, making sure we can finance, make sure councils actually support uh, financing housing on the edge of cities and, and inside um, inner cities as well. Um, so, you know, he, he actually intellectually gets it. He's got the right ideas most of the time, which we support. Um, it's just delivery I, I would be our criticism uh, of that. But um, on congestion pricing, it'd be good to see some more political consensus on that because I think that is the answer. I'm not um, going to shy away from the fact that it is quite politically challenging because basically you are asking people to uh, pay to use a road that they think they've already paid for um, uh, through through petrol tax or through, yeah, largely through petrol tax or road user charges. Um, but of course, other cities have done it. Uh, it's standard practice in many places around the world. Uh, I, I think um, it will be, you know, politically challenging for a while, but when it starts to work, um, you know, people will support it. Uh, and of course, um, you've got to build the public transport to support uh, mode shift uh, and um, options. In Wellington, we you know we have um, two train lines running from the hut. We have the Johnsonville train line. Uh, we've got more work to do um, in Auckland. So that that's the first thing that I'm pretty um, interested in and pretty excited about. The second is that we've flagged up in our discussion document is uh, moving. Uh, and Patrick sort of touched on the challenge of um, transport funding is moving transport funding away from just road user charges and, and petrol tax, um, which uh, is becoming a very poor barometer of, um, you know, the amount of uh, funding that's required and um, vehicle kilometres travel. So as we've got more electric vehicles coming on, like the Nissan Leaf I drive, um, and, and, you know, Teslas and um, Ionics, and um, I fully uh, agree with what Patrick said around um, you know, probably one of the biggest contributions we can make to climate change is uh, make sure that, you know, farmers and tradies who do, you know, 600 kilometres a day in, in rural areas um, are able to use EVs as well as, um, you know, me uh, around Lower Hutt and Wellington. Uh, so I accept all that. Um, but, you know, as and as Ubers, you know, with uh, uh, with dual uh, hybrid cars come on stream, there's become a real disconnect between um, vehicle kilometres travelled and petrol tax. So you've got this, and there's the graphs in our discussion document, you've got uh, petrol tax, the amount raised going up and up and up, but actually, um, uh, yeah, so you've got, you've got, um, you've got vehicle kilometres travelled marginally going up, but of course you're using, um, you've got uh, petrol tax going up and up and up. So you're having to tax people more in order to get, uh, to pay for the, to pay for um, transport services. So what we're proposing is moving away from petrol tax as a proxy uh, and moving towards road user charges. So um, people would actually pay for uh, what they use, basically. And of course, when you do that, you can move to a system where you have time of use pricing, you can do congestion pricing. There's technological challenges around it, but it's, it's, it's definitely possible. 
Uh, and so we're pretty excited about that. It's not something that's going to happen like, you know, like if we get elected in three months' time, it's not going to happen in 2021, um, you know, but it's something we'd want to look at in the medium term, uh, you know, sort of um, in the sort of mid um, 2020s. And um, we, we think that's the right way to go. It's also an incredibly progressive move um, because at the moment, if you drive a, you know, $2,000, 1990, you know, um, Honda Civic, um, you pay through the nose. Uh, for petrol, uh, and you've got an incredibly um, fuel and efficient car, and so you pay far more. And of course, people like me, uh, wealthy people like me who drive a Nissan Leaf uh, with my road user charges that's completely exempt from, I pay nothing uh, to use the roads um, at all. Uh, and people who drive Teslas and, and other you know, wealthy, uh, wealthier people who drive um, electric vehicles pay nothing um, at all. Uh, and even when you move to a, a road user charger system, they'll pay less. Uh, than the person driving a you know a beat up um, on the Civic, so it's a, actually an incredibly progressive move as well if you do it the right way. Um, and so, look, those are just a couple of ideas. Um, just finally, because I'm conscious that I've talked for long, like everyone else has as well. Um, it just repeat kind of what I said before, which is that uh, uh, we we will propose building new roads. Okay, um, you know, probably you people on this panel probably won't like that very much, but uh, we are going to propose building uh, new expressways and new roads. Uh, and um, you know uh, uh, that that's um, that's what we're going to propose. Uh, but we'll also, um, I, you know, I think people will be quite excited by the multimodality, if that's even a phrase, uh, of what we're proposing. Um, so you know, um, I'm a big believer in trains. I think there's a lot more we can do on the Wellington Metro network, for example. There's a lot more we can do on the Auckland uh, Metro network. The City Rail link should really just be the start of our plans around um, Auckland Rail. Um, you know, this might be a little bit controversial, but, um, you know, I've been going back through all the history and the archives and stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, if Mayor Robbie's vision in the 70s had come to fruition, you know, Auckland would be a very different place uh, to what it looks like now. And, um, you know, um, you know, I was only born in 1983, so I can't be held responsible for uh, the decisions of the Muldoon government. Uh, but uh, like many things Rob Muldoon did, uh, didn't work out so well. So anyway, um, that, that gives you a bit of a steer of where we're going. And um, it will be pro-rail. Uh, it will be um, pro-motorway as well. Uh, we, I think we've got some exciting plans around congestion. I haven't even mentioned some of the stuff around integrated ticketing and public transport authorities, which we could get into. Um, as, as I said to this, I'm trying to remember when the speech I gave. Oh, so the Chamber of Commerce in February, I said, you know, it will be significant and it will be multimodal um, and it will be cost incredible. And um, so you can expect to see that uh, when we finish it uh, <laughs> in the coming weeks and um, in the not too distant future. So thanks. Oh, kia ora, Chris. And um, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for coming on. And I'm really looking forward to the, the package when it comes out. Obviously, we'll scrutinise it very closely. Um, and, you know, I do hope that if National gets back into government sometime, which I guess you, you know you probably will, that you will be there as our as our transport minister, and we'll be able to hit you up and remind you of how pro train you've been. And on the motorways, I, you know we understand National is a it's a broad church of a party, so you you've obviously you've got to help those that uh, that are in the party that want the motorways. I'm sure it's not coming from you. You're more of a trains and uh, Nissan Leaf type guy. So um, anyway, uh, I wanted to thank you for, for coming on and coming into the kind of lion, what could be a bit of a lion's den here and for, for, for really um, uh, being a really good sport. So last prepared question, uh, and I, I, thanks everyone for sticking with us. Uh, last prepared question is for you, Oliver. And some people have noted the term mode shift. Now I have to admit that when I was elected to uh, um, the Greater Wellington Regional Council uh, last year, I didn't, I mean, I knew what mode shift was because some people had told me during the campaign what it was, but I didn't actually really know it before that. So, uh, but now I hear it all the time. So I wanted to, if, if you could maybe explain uh, what is mode shift and uh, maybe you could give us some facts and figures that might surprise us yeah um well look mode shift at, at, at its kind of very conceptual level is uh the the efforts to get people to move shift from one mode to another so but you know you're tr oftentimes you go out and take a trip in a car or a bus or a bike and and this is about being able to encourage uh the shift of the mode from you know taking your car all the time predominantly this is how we talk about it taking your car for every trip that we pretty much take in New Zealand, which is about 90% of our trips of taking cars and private trips um, to using bikes or buses or, or trains. Um, 
And the reason that it's exciting is precisely because of everything that everybody's been talking about. Um, uh, you know, uh, to your point, Patrick, um, we ended up, we kind of designed a system like this in New Zealand. Uh, we, we had a lot of land. Uh, we didn't have that big a population at the time when, you know, in the, in the early days of, uh, when we were planning our cities. And so it made sense. Of course, you'd want to give everybody a car um, because that was the good way to get it around. And what, has, what it has resulted in is we now have by, uh, you know, the, the highest level of car ownership in the OECD. So we have about 860 cars per person. Uh, sorry, per thousand people in New Zealand. Um, and it means that our entire transport system is very car dominated. It's, you know, if you live in Auckland, unless you're really in the downtown, it's very hard to exist without a car. And, that, and that's just sort of the nature of the beast. Um, and the, the kind of the, the, the corollary of that is that of course the response to this is just to go, uh, you, what you wanna do when you get a lot of these cars on the same road is you end up with congestion as, as uh, Chris was saying. And I love the idea, I love that uh, National was talking about pricing the roads because it makes total sense. It's like, we need to do that. Um, but you know, it would be better if you came along and you said, well, are there ways to be able to radically shift uh, us out of cars and into other options? And for, for a lot of people going point to point, um, you know, you can, unless we also tie that to land use, so if someone lives close to a train station, like they do maybe out in the hut, um, to being able to get to somewhere that they want to get to, it has to be on the same network. And generally speaking, not all of our travel patterns are always like that. So what, what is really exciting, uh, again, to come back to micromobility, uh, about uh, micromobility is, is, the, uh, is the ability to go point to point uh, relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. Now, the biggest kind of barrier to people being able to do that is at the moment, if you ask people, why do you not bike around Auckland or, or Wellington or any of your other kind of urban centers, um, safety is almost the key, is, is the key driver like most of the time. Um, and, and so uh, there are cities around the world that do have actually way better infrastructure than we do. And in those cities, we're seeing really high levels of adoption for micromobility. So Paris went from zero to 2%, which doesn't sound like much, but I can guarantee you when you talk to traffic engineers and you tell them that you've got a 2% mode shift in a year and it didn't cost them anything, like people just put out scooters and they started riding them around for free, it didn't cost the government anything. That is like bananas to them. They just don't know how to like fathom that. Um, and, and so for, um, we've been, to, I'm, I'm part of a study that NZTA is doing at the moment. Um, those results aren't public on what the potential mode shift for micromobility is but the, lot, the results are pretty in line with what we've seen from a report that came out of BIRD, which is one of the large global operators for Paris, uh, where they were saying they believe within a relatively short period of time, 10 to 15 years, you could see 20% of all trips in Paris being taken on micromobility devices. Um, and I think that that's incredibly exciting only because we, uh, we'd end up with a situation where it doesn't cost the government that much, and yet we provide really uh, like robust alternative options for a lot of trips that are taken inside of our cities, which means that people say, well, why would I bother taking my car? I can hardly ever get parking. It's really expensive. Um, if Chris has his way, he'll, I'll have to pay a bunch of extra taxes on taking it into expensive parts of the city. Um, well, I'd much rather just go ride my bike and everybody would be happy. Your bike is a, your bike or your e-bike or your, your pod or whatever it ends up being, uh, ends up being the fastest, most convenient and easiest way to get around the city. Um, I do also just want to point out uh, as well that there's, um, there's been some great research out of Auckland University uh, talking about what they call BCRs, and Patrick can talk to what a BCR is, but it's effectively the ROI on investment. And, and almost, uh, almost universally, uh, the, the, the returns on investment for bike claims are about 20 to 1. You know, so it's a 10 to 1, 20 to 1, it kind of depends, but you end up with uh, a very high level of return for this small amount of investment that you do end up making. Um, and yet, we're, we've just announced $12 billion of funding for our roads and almost all exclusively that's gone to motorways. Um, and we've only really announced a plan for tactical urbanism of about $7 million. So I, I think that there's a mismatch uh, here in terms of if we're really saying we wanna be data-driven about how we build infrastructure that will allow us to do this mode shift, it needs to be actual, it's, it's not, uh, I would love to lay down the challenge. I've got like how many politicians? I've got okay. I've got Chris. I've got Tamtha. I've got Thomas. I've got uh, oh Patrick. Yep, absolutely. I, I would I love to hear from you guys. How very dare you? Don't insult me with that. Yeah. Well, no, no. Only, only in the sense of look, the data shows that bike lanes are the highest returning ROI on investment 
in terms of it. We've got this massive growth of these micromobility vehicles coming. Why are we why are we not flooding the market with infrastructure investments in, in micromobility and bike lines? And that's it. That's my time. That's my time. I'm, I yield my time to you. <laughs> <laughs> kia, ora, kia ora, Oliver, and uh, yeah, so cool to have you on here as well. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for all of your um, all of your contributions, all of your fakara. We've we've gone like over time. Uh, it's kind of nine o'clock now, so it's amazing. We always say this: the two hours just kind of whoosh by like a like an electric train or a <laughs> or a light rail going down Taranaki Street. It's it's amazing. So thank you all very much, and. I'm just going to quickly uh, say uh, that we have another one next week, another Aotearoa Town Hall, uh, and I'm just going to announce who's on. We're going to be talking about inequality, which is obviously a fundamental uh, topic. Um, we have got the, uh, we've got four guests. Uh, we've got the head girl of Aorere College, uh, Fili Fepuliai Tapuai. We've got... Um, Tiano Tuyono, uh, my friend, uh, an Indigenous rights and climate activist. Um, we've got disability rights advocate and filmmaker Keta O'Regan. Uh, and we've got author and general inequality guy, uh, Max Rashbrook. So that should be uh, quite, a cool, um, quite a cool session as well. Yeah. Um, so thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for, for watching online and everyone who will watch at some point in the future and especially to our speakers uh, and guests for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Kia everybody. Kia Just going to close with a karakia. I just wanted to say real quick as well, just a massive, massive um, mahi to our mates here at the Vogelmoor Bowling Club. Yes. We were like flip-flopping about whether we were doing it in real life or not. And um, I came real late and like they brought us this 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 pizza that we yeah. were just eating because I couldn't I couldn't wait till afterwards. It just looked so good. It's they so gave good. us a beer. They're sitting out there. The fire's going. They're cracking up. They're clapping for all of the corridor. So I think this is probably a bit of a way forward for the way that we do uh, Aotearoa Town Hall. So massive shout out to those guys um, for putting it on and for their manakitanga this evening. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and just a big mihi to all of you tonight, our kai kōrero. Loved it all. So much to 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 take on board to kind of um, wānanga or, or marinate over a little bit, marinate over a little bit. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time and your contribution and um, yeah. Awesome. I'm going to close us off with a karakia. This is a new one again. Um, this one is about just confirming the cool things that we learned and talked about today in this wānanga, and it's written by Scotty Morrison, actually, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, main. Cheers, whānau. Menoi tato. Te whakai tanga e, te whakai a tanga e, tēnei te kaupapa ka e, tēnei te wānanga ka e, te mauri o te kaupapa ka whakamoia, te mauri o te wānanga ka whakamoia, Koa ki runga, koa ki raro, hau mie, hui e, tai ki. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora. Still live. The live stream's still not live. happening. Still <laughs> happening. <laughs> Just doesn't want to end, maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'll try. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right.